The Columbia is one of America's great and useful rivers. The largest North American river to flow into the Pacific Ocean. It begins as a small mountain stream in the snow fields of the Canadian Rockies and enters the United States near the northeast corner of Washington. The upper Columbia flows through deep gorges and over swift rapids. Here, the river is put to work by the giant Grand Coulee Dam. From Grand Coulee, the Columbia flows through Washington in a great curve called the Big Bend until it reaches its largest tributary, the Snake River. Then it turns west and runs into the Pacific. In this part of the Columbia is Bonneville Dam and Portland, the great river seaport of the west coast. When the Columbia empties into the Pacific, it has gone more than 1,200 miles from its source in the Canadian Rockies. Let's go back and travel down the Columbia, starting our journey at the Grand Coulee Dam in the upper river. This dam has created a lake that reaches 150 miles upstream. Columbia water is stored for use in irrigation, to help prevent floods, and to regulate the flow of the lower river. In order to hold back the tremendous force of the river, the dam had to be built into the largest masonry structure in the world. Over the spillways, more than a million cubic feet of water can flow every second. This is more than five times the amount of water passing over Niagara Falls. This rushing water is put to use in turning dynamos in the power plants at the foot of the dam. Electricity that is sent to towns and cities down the river from Grand Coulee along the Big Bend, farmers use the water of the river to irrigate their crops. Small pumping stations along the river force water up the banks to upland fields and orchards. Vast amounts of wheat are grown in the unirrigated lands farther away from the river because wheat needs less water than many other crops. The wheat farmer, however, uses the river to carry his wheat to market. The grain is loaded on barges and travels down the river to Portland to be milled into flour. The strong current of the Columbia helps provide the power which carries the barge downstream swiftly and economically. The great force of the current holds back this boat coming upstream. Nearly all of the barges coming up the river carry gasoline and other petroleum products. On this part of the Columbia, only flat-bottomed tugs and barges can travel, though many rocks and kinds of river traffic. In some places, the river is so dangerous that even shallow draft boats cannot navigate. Ten miles of canals were built around the Great Rapids at Salalo Falls to take the river barges around the rough water. This tug and its barges are passing through the canals and locks. Indians find good salmon fishing in the rapids. They have a special treaty with the government which lets them fish here at Salalo Falls the whole year round. During the canning season, the Indians sell the fish to canneries, while at other times of the year, they fish only for their own food. And they do catch many salmon. Below Salalo Falls, the wheat barge passes through the lock and enters the river again in calm water. Just a few miles below the Indians' fishing ground is the river port of the Dalles, where large quantities of wheat are loaded to be carried downriver to the mills. Fifty miles below the Dalles at Bonneville, another great dam has been erected to control the Columbia. Here, an island divides the river into two channels. The spillway section reaches across one channel, and the powerhouse and navigation locks are built across the other. Bonneville improves navigation on the river, but since the huge dam would stop all boats, a lock 500 feet long was built to let them pass. After a ship has entered the lock, the lower gates are closed, and the lock is filled with water. In about 20 minutes, the water level is raised 66 feet to the height of the river above the dam. Then, the upper gates open, and the boat goes on up the river. These locks are large enough to let ocean vessels pass through to the river above. In 
in addition to barges and ships. Great numbers of salmon also travel the river. They go up to Columbia to lay their eggs in the cold mountain streams which form the headwaters of the river. The dam across the river would have stopped them and prevented the annual runs of salmon to their spawning grounds. So a sort of winding stairway called a fish ladder was built around the dam to let the salmon pass. From late spring to early autumn, hundreds of thousands of salmon swim up the river through these ladders. The young fish hatch in the upper river and then swim downstream to the ocean where they spend most of their lives. The salmon going upstream to lay their eggs are counted as they pass through the ladder. This fish is lifted out for inspection and then return to the river so that it may continue its journey. Bonneville Dam is also used to generate electricity. The nearby cities of Portland and Vancouver use most of Bonneville's electric power. Between Bonneville and Portland, there are many beautiful views of the River Gorge. This is one of the scenic parts of the Columbia. When it is just a little over 100 miles from the ocean, the Columbia meets another of its major tributaries, the Willamette River. A few miles up the Willamette is the city of Portland, a major seaport of the Pacific coast. The great size of the river below Portland makes it possible for ocean vessels to come in from the Pacific. At this port, they are loaded with products of the farms and forests for shipment to all parts of the world. Below the junction of the Columbia and Willamette, the river is wider and calmer and becomes an important water highway. Log rafts are towed by tugs to the lumber mills along the banks. The logs are stored in ponds at the river's edge. From the ponds, they are hauled into the mills by conveyor lines to be sawed. The swift current of the upper Columbia carries much mud and silt, which falls to the bottom as the channel widens and the flow becomes gentle. Floating dredges are used to keep the river deep enough for ocean-going ships. The dredges pump mud from the river bottom along the ship channel and pipe it to the shallow water near the edge of the river. Near the mouth of the Columbia is the port of Astoria. This is the home of many fishing boats which make their catches in the river and in the nearby ocean. Most of the fresh salmon used in the United States comes from this part of the Columbia. Large canneries along the river bank pack additional for shipment to distant markets. These salmon fisheries are one of the great industries of the Columbia. Here, near its mouth, the river is about five miles wide. To cross it, automobiles and passengers must travel by ferry boat, since a bridge has not been built across the wide channel. Finally, a few miles west of Astoria, the Columbia empties into the Pacific Ocean, ending its long journey from the mountains of Canada. So, we have traced the course of the mighty Columbia, seeing how it helps the people who live near it, and how the people have changed the river. When it begins, the Columbia is a swift stream with great potential power. Dams and great reservoirs control and conserve this energy for use in furnishing electric power, in irrigating the farmlands of the Northwest, and in controlling the floods of the river. Great numbers of boats use the Columbia as a highway shallow tugs and barges on the upper river, and large ocean vessels on the lower river. As a source of fish, and as an important path of transportation, the Columbia helps support towns and cities along its banks. The Columbia River serves the people of the entire Pacific Northwest, earning its place as one of the great rivers of North America.